I have a friend who's really into photography, and he shared some of his pictures on Facebook. He posts pictures of old barns, cornfields, lighthouses perched on the shores of Lake Michigan. More recently, he's been learning the ropes of aerial photography using drones. And it's really amazing how technology has changed in just a few short years. Not long ago, digital cameras were like the cutting edge. But now there's little remote controlled aircraft that you can use to take pictures from above the ground. He can send the drone up into the sky and gain a whole new perspective. The drone is like a hummingbird that just floats through the air. He controls the altitude and the angle. If he wants a still shot, he can just make it hover in one place. If he wants to pan the horizon, he just directs it to soar slowly across the landscape. He can take still photos or videos. He did a flyover over the campus of Grace Christian University. And that's a place where I spent a lot of times as a student. But looking at the college from that angle, being able to see the whole campus at once, the, the parking lot, the quad, the administrative buildings, the classrooms, the dorms, the library and the gym, it just gives you a whole new perspective. When you're able to step back and, and see the big picture, it gives you a greater appreciation for what's there. And, and that's also true as we study the Bible. There's a time for us to zoom in and look at the details of a passage, and, and that's something we're going to do in the course of our study. But it's just as important to step back and, and to see the big picture as a whole. Take time to get an overview of the entire book that you're studying and consider how the book fits into the overall message of the Bible. In our previous lesson, we mentioned the importance of context, paying attention to the verses that come before our passage and that follow afterwards. That's a part of this step, but now we're going to move even further out to look at the background of the book as a whole. Looking at the big picture allows us to see where we are in our reading compared to the overall movement of the book. It, it keeps us from getting lost in the particulars. Maybe you've heard the figure of speech, boy, that guy doesn't see the forest from the trees. But we mean that the person has become so consumed with the details, they've lost sight of the larger situation. Kind of like a guy who's staring at the trunk of a tree, and he fails to see everything else that's around him. And we don't want that to be the case for us as we study the Bible. We want to be able to see the trees and the forest. Looking at the big picture is kind of like having a map that helps us to navigate through the different sections of the book. It gives us a greater appreciation for each individual passage and how all of that fits together to form the full counsel of God's word. Christian author K. Arthur writes, one of our first steps is to get an overview of the book that we're studying. An overview enables you to discover the overall context of the author's message and helps you establish the framework of the book. Getting an overview is like going up 3,000 feet in an airplane to take pictures of the land that you're thinking of purchasing. At 3,000 feet, you can't see the details of the property, but you can see the boundaries and the general lay of the land. And once you get those pictures, you'll zoom in to get a closer perspective of it, acre by acre. Then eventually, you'll land the plane, get out, and walk the land. As you do this, with the photos in your hands, you'll gain a proper perspective of where you are and how everything on that property relates to the big picture. So an overview of, of the book is going to help us see the message of the book as a whole in its entirety. We're going to be able to identify the main themes of a book. We're going to be aware of the structure of the book. We're going to understand the relationship of, of the verses and the chapters and how they relate to one another. We're going to have a, a sound basis for accurate interpretation and a correct application. We're going to focus on two passages in this lesson that encourage us to see the big picture. To get the big picture, we first need to survey the entire book. We want to know what makes this book of the Bible unique from all the other books. What's the background? What is the setting? What is the purpose of the book? Sometimes we can find answers to those questions in the opening lines of whatever book we're studying. That's the case if we go to Luke chapter 1 and look at the opening paragraph. Luke chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Luke writes, And as much as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word and have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, 
so that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Now, this is a passage that we might have just flown through. If you were reading through this passage in your devotions, you might have thought, I want to get to the good stuff. Why do I need to care about Theophilus? Who's that anyways? Actually, this opening paragraph is important because it contains lots of information about the background of the gospel. Now, that's not always the case when you're reading a, a book of the Bible. You might not read anything about who wrote it or when it was written or what was going on. Mark, for instance, is a very different gospel. He has a very different style. He kind of just drops us into the action like you're part of the crowd trying to figure out, well, who is Jesus and what's going on? And Mark kind of just drops us into the crowd. He doesn't give us a lot of background. But Luke, Luke takes the time to set the stage. He gives us all kinds of good information to help us understand what's he writing about. Why is he writing this? He's a little more methodical in his approach. I appreciate that. We, we learn something about the author as we uh, are reading through this opening line. He, he doesn't sign his name here at the top of the page, but we can tell it's somebody who was close to the apostles. He had access to firsthand information about the life and ministry of Jesus. He tells us that he wasn't an eyewitness of all of the events as the 12 apostles were, but he knew the people who were there, and he was able to interview them and record their testimony. In verse 2, he, he talks about these accounts. He says, as they were handed down to us by those who were the first, who were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. See, he's interested in preserving their testimony and arranging that in an orderly fashion so that we can learn about these things just as he learned about them. In a sense, he's, he's doing the work of a historian or a biographer. He's compiling an accurate account of the life of Jesus. See, Luke was able to sit down with people like Peter and Mark and, and, uh, and John, and, and he could sit down with Paul, and, and he could hear it from them firsthand. He wants us to hear that as well. Later on in Scripture, we're told that the same person who wrote the Gospel of Luke is also the author of the book of Acts. We know from the context of that book, it was a close associate of the Apostle Paul. Because there's several places where he speaks in the first person. He says things like, we set sail, or we stayed in the city for several days. So that tells us he was a part of Paul's missionary team. Now, Scripture gives us a pretty good list of Paul's associates, so it doesn't take much to figure out which person wrote this book. We also have outside evidence in the words of the early church fathers, those leaders who lived just a generation or two after these things took place. And all of them point to Luke, the physician, as the author of the book. So that tells us about the authorship. There's clues about the date this book was written in these opening lines of, of Luke. And we may not be able to pin down the specific date, but it must have been written after the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus because he writes about those things. There's a good chance it was written after Matthew and Mark because he refers to other accounts of the life of Jesus that had already been written. Because we know that Luke and Acts are connected, we can use the events of that book to help us date this book. In the book of Acts, at the very end, Paul remains imprisoned in Rome, awaiting the outcome of his trial before the emperor. So that means that Luke and Acts must have been written before the outcome of the trial. So a good window for the date of this book would be sometime between 60 and 65 AD. The opening paragraph also tells us something about the audience. Who are the people that received this book for the very first time? Who are the first ones to read it? Well, verse 3 says the book is addressed to a man named Theophilus. Who was he? We're, we're not entirely sure. He's only mentioned here in Luke chapter 1 and then once again in Acts chapter 1. His name, Theophilus, means friend of God in Greek. In a sense, we might say that, that these words are meant for everyone who would become a friend of God through Christ. But it seems clear that he's writing to a specific person, maybe a relatively new believer. Luke is writing these words, hoping it will help Theophilus to grow in his faith and in, in, in his relationship with Jesus. Theophilus was probably some kind of an official or some kind of person of influence because Luke uses a title, Most Excellent Theophilus. That's the kind of formal greeting that you might use, a, a term of respect you might use if you're talking to a judge or a governor. Theophilus was among the original readers. But at the same time, we know that the book was meant for a much larger audience. Luke wasn't just writing it for one guy. He wanted everyone and anyone who would listen to the good news of Jesus to read these words. Now, as we mentioned, Luke was a part of Paul's missionary team. 
In the book of Acts, they traveled around the Roman Empire presenting the gospel, proclaiming the gospel beyond the borders of Israel to the Gentile nations. So it makes sense that his audience included a lot of different kinds of people from different backgrounds, everyone they met along the way. We also learned something here in these opening lines about the purpose of the book. Why, why did Luke write his gospel? Well, he tells us in verses 3 and 4, Since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, <clears throat> so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. He wants us to know that, that the message that we've received is truthful and accurate and reliable. His, his purpose here is to present an accurate account of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. Our faith rests upon historical facts and the eyewitness testimony that would hold up even under the most careful investigation. From the outset, we know what to expect in the chapters ahead. Luke is about the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that includes the message he preached and the works he performed all the way through the cross and the empty tomb. We also learn from the passage, this is a gospel. The word gospel means good news. But in this case, it's the good news about Jesus Christ. This tells us the message is really important. There, there's four gospels in our Bible, not just one. And, and so that means that, that God really wants us to pay attention and, and focus in and understand who Jesus is. There's four gospels, not one. Each one tells us the story from a slightly different perspective, and that gives us a fuller understanding. The Gospels are a, a type of, of writing, an ancient biography. And so as we approach this book, we understand that, that biographies work in, in a certain way, and so we read it in light of, of that type of literature. That gets us thinking about other genres of literature that are contained in Scripture. We talk about Gospels. Those are ancient biographies, a biography of Jesus. There are historical books, prophetic books. Some of those can be classified as wisdom literature. There are epistles, which are letters written to people or churches. So knowing the type of book that you're reading can help you to better understand that book. That's the kind of background information that I'm talking about when I say we need to step back and see the big picture. Who's the author? When was it written? What is the purpose? What are the major themes here? Who are the original audience? How is the book structured? We need answers to those questions. Notice we've come back to the questions from our previous lesson, the, the five W's and the H, who, what, when, where, why, and how. And we want a good outline of the book as well to see how the different sections of the book are arranged. Not every book of the Bible will, will contain all of that information in the opening paragraph, so we're going to have to read the whole book to fill in the blanks. There's lots of resources that can help us do that, like Bible surveys and introductions, and we'll talk about those a little later. Each book of the Bible was written at a particular moment in history by a particular person for a particular people to address a particular need, and it will enhance our study of the passage if we take time to zoom out and understand the background of that individual book. It's really easy to lose sight of that. When we ask, who's the author, someone might respond, well, God's the author, isn't he? And yes, absolutely, that's true. There's one divine author for all of Scripture, but he chose to, to reveal his word through many human authors. God spoke through the biblical authors. Each of them were inspired by the Holy Spirit, and he, and he spoke through them. He used their perspective and their writing style and, and their way of communicating, but he, he used them to speak his word. A passage like 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21 gives us an insight into that, that dual authorship of Scripture. And Peter tells us in that passage, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And he, he's talking about prophecy, and he means really all of Scripture. No passage of Scripture has is, is come about just because a, a person thought it up. It was his own opinion or his own idea. No, God was speaking through the biblical authors. He, he used real men, real circumstances, real places, real moment in time, to deliver his word to us. So if we learn about these men and their backgrounds and their circumstances, then we can, we can gain insight into the books that they wrote. If I were to ask a question like, like when, was, when was the book written? Somebody might respond, well, why does that matter? Isn't this the living and enduring word of God? 
And again, yeah, the answer is yes. This is absolutely the living and enduring word of God. The message is just as true today as it ever was. But the Bible describes real events that took place at specific moments in human history. So when we learn about those circumstances in that period of time, it gives us better insight into our passage. When we ask, who's the, re the original audience? Someone might say, well, who cares? Does, does, does the Bible, isn't the Bible written for everybody? And again, of course, God's word is for everybody. But we have to remember the Lord revealed himself to different people in different ways, in different places, at different periods of time. If we were to, to look at the different passages of Scripture and the different books of the Bible, we could, we could go back to Exodus, where God told Moses to slaughter the Passover lamb. And we realize that passage isn't, the, the instruction isn't addressed to us today. Thank goodness, right? When he tells Joshua in the book of Joshua to march around the city of Jericho, we realize that's not a command he's given to us to reenact today. We're not the original audience, but we can certainly learn something from those events. We learn about who God is and what it means to follow him. There's, there's all kinds of lessons that we can take away. So the instructions aren't written to us, but all scripture is written for us. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 says, All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So we need all 66 books of the Bible. Every passage of scripture, we believe, is there for a reason. But it's helpful to know something about the people and the situations in which those words were first spoken, or else we might misunderstand how it applies to us. God didn't reach down from heaven and just drop the completed Bible bound in leather, red letters, Genesis to Revelation, all at once. He revealed himself progressively over thousands of years through prophets and apostles to give us the completed word. So gaining an overview of the specific book that we're studying will help us to handle scripture more accurately. One preacher named Miles Coverdale, he lived uh, during the days, days of the Protestant Reformation from 1488 to, to 1569. He once said this, It shall greatly help you to understand scripture if you mark not only what is spoken or written, but of whom, and unto whom, and with what words, at what time, where, to what intent, with what circumstance, considering what goes before and what follows after. Now that is really good advice that we ought to heed. It's been said that all scripture is for us, but not every portion of the Bible was written directly to us. That's an important distinction. The book of Leviticus contains all kinds of information about the Old Testament sacrifices. It's written for us, for our instruction to teach us about the holiness of God and the seriousness of sin and our need for atonement. But it wasn't written directly to us as if we should continue to offer those same sacrifices or perform those same rituals. Leviticus was written to the people of Israel during the days of the Old Covenant at a particular place in a particular time. So we can see why it's important to step back and gain an overview of the book that we're studying. Christian author Craig Keener says, while it is important to read each passage in the context that immediately surrounds it, it is also important to read it in the context of the entire book in which it appears. This is the way God gave us most of the Bible, inspiring particular authors to write books, which the first readers received one book at a time. Often the particular passage we are studying fits into an argument that runs through that entire book of the Bible. He goes on and he, and he says, um, viewed in light of how the book treats that theme elsewhere, the points in our passage become much clearer. We must not focus so much on the difficult details at the beginning of our study that we miss the larger picture of what the book of the Bible is trying to say. One can work on more details later. We should look for the themes that follow through any particular book of the Bible. We should get the flow of the argument in any book of the Bible where that is relevant. That's really good advice for us. See the big picture. To get the big picture, we also need to appreciate the overall message of Scripture. Turn to the end of Luke's Gospel, Luke 24, verses 44 through 49. We're going to the end. We're skipping past to the death and resurrection of Christ when he appears to his disciples. There had been so much they hadn't been able to understand up to this point. But now that Jesus had risen from the dead, he opens their eyes to understand the Scriptures. In Luke 24, verse 44, we read, Then he said to them, 
These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. This was one of those moments when the light bulb goes on and they're no longer in the dark. Everything that's just happened had been so confusing to them. It, it didn't make sense that the Messiah had to suffer and die. But they really shouldn't have been in the dark. It, it was there all along, even if they had missed it. The whole Bible from the beginning to the end is pointing to Jesus. The law and the prophets and the Psalms were all speaking of him and the work that he would accomplish. Now that phrase, the law and the Psalms and the prophets, that's, that's one way of saying all of the Old Testament, all of the scriptures at that time. There were three main divisions in the Hebrew Bible. It, it would be like when we say Genesis to Revelation, and we mean the whole Bible, cover to cover, front to back, every part in between. That, that was their way of saying all of the scriptures. The cross wasn't something new that just came out of nowhere. It was part of God's plan all along, from the beginning. And there were shadows that, that pointed ahead. The saving work of Jesus is the unifying theme that runs throughout the entire Bible. We've mentioned the differences between the different books. There's a total of 66 books in the Bible, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. And these were written over a span of thousands of years on different continents by some 40 different authors who came from all backgrounds and different walks of life. And yet the amazing thing is that all of these books fit together as a whole to tell one continuous story. It's the story of God's love for humanity and the great lengths he was willing to go through in order to deliver us from our sin. My children enjoy reading books from the school library. And some of the books belong to a larger series. Each novel tells a story with its own characters, its own plot, its own development, but, but the individual book fits together as part of a larger story. It advances a greater narrative that unfolds over the whole series of books. When they finish one, they can't wait to read the next to see what happens to their favorite characters. A scripture is also a collection of books, but of a different sort. Not ordinary books, but a divine library. All 66 books are united around a common theme to present one overall message about the God who stepped down from glory to redeem humanity. It's necessary then when we study the Bible, not just to consider the background of this one book that we're reading, but how does this book fit into the flow of redemptive history? That's a phrase we may not use all the time, but I think it's important. Redemptive history is the unfolding story of salvation as revealed in scripture. It's the series of events that make up the plan of God to redeem us, starting at creation, leading to the cross, reaching its goal, finally in the new heavens and the new earth. When Jesus told the disciples the events of his death and resurrection were necessary and that the law and the prophets were all pointing to him, he's, he's telling us this was part of God's plan all along to bring salvation. In that sense, we could say the cross is at the very center of redemptive history. And, and the entire Old Testament is leading up to that moment. It's the foundation for everything that follows in the New Testament. Scripture tells us that God has a purpose. He's not somebody who makes it up as he goes along. He's intentional about what he does. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows everything that's going to take place in between. His hand is guiding the events of history to accomplish his purpose. We see that in a passage like Isaiah 46, verses 9 through 10. Remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things which have not been done saying, my purpose will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. God says, I declare the end from the beginning. My purpose is going to happen. We don't have to, to worry about whether or not the history is going anywhere. History is going the direction that God wants it to go. He has a purpose. That purpose will be established. If we're in Genesis, we know the cross is still a long ways off. And yet when we read about the call of Abraham to take his son Isaac to the land of Moriah to offer the boy to the Lord, we realize this event is actually pointing forward to what God the Father would one day do by sending his son Jesus. When the Lord provided Abraham with a ram as a substitute, we see a picture of how Christ became our substitute on the cross, dying in our place. Now that doesn't take away from what was happening in that immediate context. Those were real events that took place. 
But we realize this event is part of a larger story. And we can't really fully appreciate that event, Abraham offering his son, unless we see it in light of the bigger picture of, of the Bible. There's one unified message in the Bible, but it unfolds through a series of stages that we might call dispensations. A dispensation is an era of redemptive history. So when we read the Bible, it's important for us to have an awareness of these major movements or the major dispensations and how they fit together. Where do we stand on that timeline? What about the passage of scripture we're reading? Where does that fit in the timeline? We should pay attention to where we are in the timeline of redemptive history as we study the Bible. Now, maybe you're thinking, I've got a long ways to go before I can put all of these pieces together. There's a lot of information to keep track of. The Bible's a huge book. But remember, this is a process. Spending time in God's Word is a lifelong journey. The more we study, the more we learn. So don't let this overwhelm you. Let it excite you. I'm sure most of us have opened the cover of a novel, eager to jump into the story and see what happens next. So let's jump into our Bibles with that same kind of enthusiasm, eager to open the pages of Scripture to see how the story of redemption unfolds. In each lesson we've done, I've wanted to leave you with a skill that you can use as you study the Bible. And these are tools. These tools are not substitutes for reading the Bible for ourselves, but they're meant to help us get the most out of our study. The best way to get an overview of a particular book is to read through the book from the beginning to end, and that takes time. It's one of the reasons pastors should spend time preaching and teaching through the different books of the Bible. Those kinds of studies are important. If, if topical studies is all we ever did, jumping around to different parts of the Bible every week, it's going to be difficult to gain a sense of continuity, to see how it all connects together. Topical studies definitely have their place, but it's also important in the ministry of a church to spend time working through books of the Bible as a whole. So as we study the Bible, a, a good tool for us to have is called a Bible survey. If, if you have a study Bible, there's probably a survey at the, at the beginning of, of each book of the Bible. Um, the ESV study Bible does a really good job of that. Just, just remember that study Bibles are kind of like the Swiss army knife of the Bible study tools. It gives you a good background info. It gives you a short article here and there comments on key themes. It includes maps and illustrations. Under the text is a little commentary. That's, it's good stuff, but it's really condensed. So there's times we want to go deeper. We need to reach for the larger resource. And so Bible surveys and Bible introductions are resources you can use to learn more about the background of that book of the Bible that you're studying. And a, a survey or an introduction will discuss information like the authorship of a book, the date, the book was written, the original audience, the purpose of the book, themes of the book, the genre of literature, and even a good outline of the book. So those are really helpful tools to have. And I encourage you to, uh, if you're building a, a library, to find a good Bible survey uh, or a good Bible introduction. In the lab, you're going to learn how to use these kinds of resources to enhance your knowledge of the background of the book so you can get the big picture of what you're studying.